Okay. Um, so hopefully folks can can see my screen. Um, let me know if you can't. Uh, I am David Cohn. I think everyone here probably knows me, but I'll say it for the potential uh, folks later uh, who view this in, in, in the future, uh, the recording or whatever. Um, welcome to a, a, a bit of a brown bag that I'm going to do on, uh, like, sort of based on my most recent blog post. Um, but uh, we'll definitely get into to more details if folks want. Um, so what we're going to go over here is how Postgres aggregation works and then how it influenced the hyperfunctions uh, two-step aggregate design. Um, uh, a couple quick notes. Uh, we're going to, uh, I'll get to the agenda in a sec, but, and I'll tell you, we'll pause for questions at a couple points throughout. Um, also, there appears to be a mosquito that got into the house and is like buzzing around me. So if I start like pausing and swatting at the air at some point, just forgive me. Um, it's probably because I'm getting eaten. Um, so uh, yeah, so I think that, that one of the important things here is to, to understand the goals of the hyperfunctions API. Um, which are to sort of work within the SQL language, make them make everything intuitive um, for both new and experienced SQL users. Uh, we want everything to be useful for a few rows, but also high performance on billions of rows. Um, and then play nicely with all the time scale view features and ideally make them actually more useful. Um, and so the general goal is make fundamental things simple and then make more advanced analyses possible, make things composable, make things really able to build up more advanced analyses. So what we're trying to get to today is an understanding of why we did two-step aggregation uh, given those design uh, parameters, um, why we did a two-step aggregation that's something like average of time weight, which means we have this ag aggregate, which is time weight in this case, and an accessor on the outside, rather than something that might seem more simple at first glance, which is like, okay, why didn't we just put everything straight into the aggregate and let it all work from there? So that's sort of the motivation of this talk is to understand why we made these choices. Um, in order to do that, we have uh, a whole background on how Postgres aggregation works and, and how it actually influenced that decision. Um, but that's really what we're trying to get to an understanding of. Um, so the agenda is basically how Postgres aggregation works through pictures, um, how it relates then to two-step aggregates, um, and then why we use hyper, hyper functions use the two-step design pattern. Um, and then finally, how the two-step design impacts time-weighted average code. Um, so I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through the first part, which is the Postgres aggregation through pictures first, um, and then pause for some questions there and then we'll get into how it relates to two-step aggregates uh, and basically the rest. Um, and then we'll pause for questions again at the end. Um, so that's the basic plan. So without further ado, um, how Postgres aggregation works through pictures. And this is inspired by Bruce Momgen, who was, uh, gave these great explaining Postgres internals through pictures talk, talks. He also loves bow ties. This is a, a gif of me putting on a bow tie. I was thinking about wearing a bow tie today, but I, it's a little hot here and I decided that uh, that was going to be a little much. Um, so um, the first thing to understand is the difference between aggregate and a function um, in SQL, which is that an aggregate works on multiple rows where the function works on a single row. Um, so you can think about something like this. If we had a table foo with a timestamp and a value, um, I guess actually this is slightly off. This should be a bar and baz, not just a value. Um, and we had say two values there. So uh, if this were bar and baz, you'd insert into that, you'd get a few values. Uh, yeah, we can change that later. Um, but you can think about doing this as uh, you'd have a greatest is a function call. So on every row, it's gonna look at bar and baz and choose the largest value for each row. So we get three results um, and then the uh, max aggregate works similarly. It's going to get the greatest value, but it's going to do it over each of the, the columns. So we have a bar max and a baz max, and that's going to get the largest value in each of the columns in essence. So that's working on multiple rows rather than for each row, taking it and getting a result. So 
a graphical representation of that. Max bar takes each of the values one, two, and three, and outputs three. So um, the thing that, that you should understand about this is that aggregates still work row by row. So it's not like we are going through and like getting all of the rows and somehow processing all of the rows at once. Um, we are actually still working uh, essentially on a row by row basis. That's how all of Postgres basically works. It's all gonna happen row by row in some way. So how does it actually look? Well, we start off with some state. So basically an aggregate is working on some internal state. It's gonna keep that internal state and then it's gonna process each row, update its internal state and that's how it keeps track of all the things that it has seen. So let's look at how max works. So we start off, our state is null um, we see our first row and we're just going to populate that state. So, okay, so the first row we see is one. Um, and so we populate our state with one. When we see our next row, then we see that it's greater than one, it's two, so it's greater than one. We're going to replace it. And then we see our next row and it's still greater than two. So we compare it to our state on each row and then take the largest one. And that's basically how the max aggregate works. And then eventually, once we have no more rows, we output a result. Um, and I'm just going to mute folks until we start questions, just so that we don't get interference there. Um, so now there's a special function that is doing that. And that's called the state transition function, or just transition function for short. Um, so that function is, uh, is that thing that was doing that comparison. So all of the comparisons that we were just talking about, I was sort of taking the role of the transition function, which is then taking, basically it takes the previous uh, row um, and it looks at it, compares it, or it takes in the current row and the current state, and then does something to them, outputs a new state. So what about aggregates with more complex state? We could think about that. Um, let's look at something like average, right? An average is defined as the sum divided by the count. So naturally our state is then going to keep the sum and the count inside and only at the end we'll, we'll figure out what we do, we divide. But let's look at the, let's keep the sum and the count here. So as we go through and as rows get added in, we start off with our state as null um, and then we populate it uh, on the first row. So we're now 1.0, our count is one. Uh, we then see that as we get our second row through, we add so that we're keeping the sum on the left side and we get our count on the right side. We now have two rows and their total value added up to three. And then we get in our next row and it's slightly laggy. Um, and as, we, as that gets added in, we see we go up to 6.0 and three. So that's great. Um, so the question though is, well, we know that we need to get our result but we need something to then do that division. We need to divide the sum by the count. So what is that thing called? Um, well, in the aggregate definition, that's called the final function. Um, so it does that operation where it takes the, the state that, ha that, that exists, the final state after we have processed all of our rows and does some operation on that final state and outputs a result to the user. So that's what the final function is doing. Um, so if we look at this sort of definitionally in pseudocode, we have our next state is given by transition function of the current state and, and the current value, the current value from the row. Um, there could be multiple values depending on the type of aggregate that it is, but that's the basic gist. Um, and our final function gives us a result based on the final state. Um, so one thing to note here is that the transition function is the most expensive part, not necessarily because the transition function is inherently more expensive than the final function, but just because it's getting called much more frequently. So um, it's getting called for every row, right? So we might have many, many, many rows, thousands, millions, whatever, that go in and get processed by the transition function. Whereas the final function is getting called once per group of rows. So we only call that once every time we want to output a result to the user. Um, and so that's important to understand for various optimizations that Postgres does. Um, 
So one thing that we could do in order to speed things up is parallelize the processing of the transition function, right? If we have something that is, that's expensive, why not spread it over multiple users? So then we get something that looks like this. So we have multiple rows. I added a few more rows to our data set here. Um, and they're going in to a couple of instances that we have spun up of basically the transition function. So we start off with the sum of the count. Um, as the first row goes in, our states are null. Um, and we see that each state gets populated in each of our parallel uh, instances here with the sum and the count for the rows that it has seen. So each set gets each uh, instance gets some subset of rows and it goes through and it populates the state, the sum and the count for each one. Once there are no more rows in both, well, now we have to do something different. So um, what's going to happen here? Um, sorry. Things are skipping a little bit. Let me. OK, uh, so I think we're good. Uh, so what we have, what we end up with in each of our two instances, we have uh, a transition, a partial transition state, a partial state. Um, and we need, we know that eventually we're going to apply the final function and get a result. But the final function, if you remember, is defined to work on the final state. It's not defined to work on two partial states. That's not how the final function works. So we need something else in order to, uh, in order to get a final state so that the final function can do its work correctly. And that, so there's something in between the transition function in each worker that creates partial states and a, a, the final function, we call that the combined function. It's actually very nicely named. Um, so the combined function takes a couple of partial states, takes multiple partial states and runs sort of iteratively over the number of workers that you have. You can imagine that if you had three workers, it would output a combined state and then it could take the combined state and use that to run over the next worker, um, et cetera. So it's actually kind of like an aggregate, but that's fine. It's basically, um, you can think of it as just taking in two partial states and outputting a combined state. And then you can run that as many times as you need to in order to get to one combined final state uh, so that the final function can run. So what that looks like is we get a combined function uh, and it takes the results from our two partial states. And it's going to be slightly different than, the, than what the transition function is doing, because now it's taking in another state. So it's going to add both the sums and the counts in this case. So for average, it's going to add the sums of the counts together, which you can see it does here. Um, and then that can get passed to the final function and output our result. Cool. So then there's another fun sort of optimization that we can do. Um, we can do deduplication. So if we have multiple calls to the same uh, aggregate, in this case, um, so we have average bar and then average bar divided by two is the half, half average. We don't wanna calculate the whole transition function for that, right? We don't want to, to redo that. There could be a thousand rows. We wanna just take the result of that average and then divide by two. Um, that's much better. And so Postgres can do that. It knows enough to see, hey, look, I have the same thing appearing multiple times. This is very expensive. I don't want to, uh, actually recalculate that entire thing. I can just calculate it once and then use the result twice when I output it to the user. Um, and it can even do that um, uh, within, uh, you know, this is getting a little bit beyond, uh, a little bit beyond the, the normal stuff here, but um, it can even do that for transition functions and have multiple final functions that work on the same final transition state. So you can actually do the, the, the internal part that just does the transition function. And if you have multiple things that can use that state, uh, there will be multiple outputs there. So let me pause for a minute and see if there are any questions on just sort of the Postgres side of things. Um, and then we'll go, uh, we'll move on from there. So any questions here? <laughs> 
otherwise, I will move straight on to how it affects our two-step aggregates. Okay, so then it seems like we're, this is pretty clear. Um, so let's talk a little bit about then how this, uh, this, but Ryan, was there something? Well, I was just gonna ask, I mean, it, it's so, every talk I ever see about aggregates and every time I ever talk about aggregates, we always say some average min max, right? What are, are, are there, are there other challenges aside from those are very easy to conceptualize generally, you know, yeah. other, other aggregate functions when it comes to that transition and, and final, are there, you know, how are some, yeah. there's, gotta be, so, there's gotta be other complications and how are those overcome or how are those dealt with if you can briefly explain in some way and maybe. Yeah. Comes. So there's actually a fair amount of literature on, on, on that. Um, that is a, a bit more detailed and, and Postgres uses some, some interesting approaches to deal with some of that. So for instance, um, uh, for things like the statistical aggregates, it uses Young's Kramer method in order to make sure that we have uh, stable uh, floating point calculations um, for, uh, for statistical aggregates, for instance. So the internal state that it keeps is slightly different than you would do if you just had the naive sort of statistical implementation. Uh, for, you know, th this is all also available to the, the custom aggregates. So all the stuff that we're doing um, in toolkit and for hyperfunctions, those are all custom aggregates that, that have their own internal state that is entirely opaque to the user. So one thing that I think like we'll get to in a minute is like it's a like it's a little hard to figure out exactly what's going on inside some of these functions sometimes. Um, certainly for the user, like it's pretty opaque what's going on. Um, and so there are sometimes like for some, an average, you kind of know. Um, but if you start doing slope, uh, or if you are doing some of these custom aggregates that we're developing, it's just like, I don't, I don't know. I shouldn't have to know in order to be able to use them effectively. Um, and that's one of the things that we're going to get into as we get into the two-step aggregate stuff is how we make it much more clear what the, what the proper operations are that you can do um, so that it's more clear to the user um, without having to know all the stuff that's going on inside the aggregate, um, what like what they are allowed to do based on the API that we give them. Um, so that's one thing that I think we're gonna we're gonna cover as we get into the the two step. Does that sort of answer what you're what you're looking yeah, for? Yeah, that's that's a good that's a good first first go at it. Cool. So. Um, a quick section on how this aggregation that we just talked about, so all the stuff around um, uh, around transition functions, combined functions, final functions, how that relates to our two-step aggregates. So just to refresh, um, as we talked about uh, right at the top, um, we have a, for all of our two-step aggregates, we have an inner aggregate call, something like time weight or percentile ag, that works on the, uh, the value, say, um, and then an outer accessor call. So that's how we sort of define these terms. Um, and you'll note that all the functions here have, a, have an analogous, uh, e each Postgres internal function has an analogous thing in the two-step uh, aggregate design pattern. Um, so the transition function, as we talked about, is basically what the aggregate is doing. Um, and the final function is what the accessor is doing. And we have here the um, uh, and ex examples of what those are, time weight, percentile, ag, average, cross percentile. So um, that's something useful to know. You'll also, we haven't really talked about this yet, but we'll get into it in a minute. We also have an, an, an analogous function to the combined function. It's called roll up. Um, and we've defined that sort of consistently across our APIs to be called roll up. So you can call a roll up on an aggregate and it's actually a second level of aggregation essentially. So you can re-aggregate things and we'll get into that in a minute. So that's how it relates. Um, and then I, I think this is sort of the meat of the talk in some ways, we wanna get into why. So a reminder that like, these are the goals. We want to work with a SQL language. We want it to be intuitive, useful for a few rows, performant, high performance with, bill, with billions. Um, and then play nicely with time scale features, make them more useful and make fundamental things simple and advanced things possible. 
But how does that actually relate to this? Well, there are basically four reasons um, that we have adopted the two-step aggregation design. Um, and I'm going to go through them quickly here, and then we're going to go into detail on each one of them. So we allow multi-parameter aggregates to reuse state. We cleanly distinguish between parameters that affect aggregates versus accessors. We enable easy to understand rollups and allow easier retrospective analysis uh, of especially downsampled data and continuous aggregates. So we're going to go through each of these in turn uh, and, and see sort of how this affected our design. So first off, allowing multi-parameter multi aggregates to reuse state. So when we talked about deduplication a little bit ago, we had this table, well, we have a table like this, where we have a timestamp and a value, we have average of value, and then average of value divided by two, and we said we could reuse the result. So that's nice. Um, now this, it turns out, is an equivalent statement, right? I could say average of value and average of value divided by two, I just moved my parentheses. And it turns out those are equivalent in this case. But Postgres can't figure that out. You actually have to have the exact same things inside because it doesn't know which aggregates are completely commutative such that you can you know, uh, actually do this. You can get the same result by sort of moving the parentheses around. Um, it, that's very much uh, based on the aggregates internals. You'd have to give it lots of information in order to know how to do that properly. Um, so that's that's one thing. Um, for instance, count, right? You can't do that for. If you do count of one divided by two, it's still just going to count one each time. So it's not the same as count of star divided by two. Um, so there are various things that could that could happen here. So the the Postgres can't really just optimize that away. Um, Sometimes we, in other words, sometimes we just have to talk away and the database can understand. Um, and our, our, deal, our ideal way of doing this, um, according to our sort of rules of APIs, is we want to make it hard for users to write low performance code, right? That's the, like, we want the default option to be a performance option. So um, let's look at how this works with two step aggregates. You'll see that. When I do percentile ag of val, it's exactly the same throughout. And so this percentile ag val function is the same as if I ran percentile ag and then ran the accessor function of prox percentile um, over the subselect. Let's compare that to what would happen if we had sort of the one step aggregate approach where you see we can't deduplicate this, and that's because we have different, well, in the two-step approach, we have the same value every time. And the, the, so the aggregate is running over a constant value, and the aggregate itself is constant. Whereas in the one-step approach, oh, I thought I had a red version of that. Oh, well, uh, oh, I do. No, I don't. There we are. Uh, it just skipped it. Okay, so in the one-step approach, that first argument keeps changing. So we now have three different aggregates, essentially. essentially. And the planner and, and Postgres can't figure out what's going on and is not able to deduplicate it because all of our, all of our arguments keep changing. Um, whereas in the two-step approach, the arguments stay the same. And so we can deduplicate that nicely. And this presentation appears to be getting slightly too big for Google Slides. Um, this is what happens when you have too many pictures. Um, so um, and again, let's remember that the transition function, right, is called once per row, and the final function is called once per group of rows. And in the two-step equivalent, right, we can say that the aggregate is, is producing that state, which is called once per row, and the accessor is called once per group of rows. And so running the accessor multiple times over the output of a single aggregate is far, far, far more efficient than running three separate aggregates, which have to process all of the rows that go into them multiple times. Um, it can be thousands of times more efficient depending on the number of rows that are going to in, into, into each group. So 
Um, uh, so yes, yeah, so this allows us to, to, to duplicate very nicely. Um, it also allows us to do this for multiple accessors. So not just that one accessor for a box percentile, but now we have accessors that take different numbers of arguments um, or different types of arguments. And all of them just take the same aggregate function. It gets deduplicated nicely by the planner um, and everything just works, uh, even if there's multiple different types of accessors. And again, this is really to make the default option the high performance option. So there's no weird thing where it's like, oh, I did it one way and it worked really nicely. And then I wrote it in a slightly different way an equivalent statement in a slightly different way like we talked about right at the beginning here, right? So like whichever way you decide to write it, whichever way is easier for you to understand as a developer, you can write it like that. The planner is gonna treat them the same and Postgres is gonna treat them the same. They're both gonna be high, as high performance as we can get. Um, we're not doing something where you have to invoke some black magic and write your, your query in exactly the right way in order to get the high performance result. Cool. So now our second why, um, we wanna cleanly distinguish between parameters that affect the aggregates versus the accessors. And that's gonna make performance implications easy to understand. So one part of this is just like uh, very sort of simple and obvious, which is we have some aggregates, for instance, UDD sketch is the uh, actually the algorithm that runs under the hood when you run percentile ag. Um, so that's the that's what the percentile approximation is doing. Um, in this case, we have other types of percentile approximations, but UDD sketch is the default. Um, it takes some extra parameters. Uh, so for instance, the two parameters in UDD sketch are uh, other than value, the value that we're actually doing the percentile of, um, are the number of buckets that we're going to keep and the target error. Um, so if I want to get two different medians, say, um, then I just modify the terms in the UDD sketch. Now, if we had a one-step aggregate, right, all of those parameters, the ones that affect the accessor or props percentile, and the ones that affect the aggregate are just going to all be jumbled up together. So this is sort of the aesthetic thing is like, it's just really hard to tell what's what, especially because aggregates, it turns out, don't actually allow you to use named parameters. You can like define them that way, but you can't actually use named parameters to call an aggregate. Um, so like, it's just really tough to figure out what's going on here. Um, and it makes it, in my mind at least, much, much harder to read um, and harder to figure out for the user. Um, so here we're able to just distinguish it very easily by having a separate aggregate where it's very clear which, which parameters affect the aggregate function. And that's important to know because like we said, the aggregate is the thing that is going to affect performance much more than the accessor. I can call the accessor many, many times with very little performance Im Im implications because it's getting called only on the output of the aggregate, which is run on every row. But if I do this, then I know that I'm getting another aggregate that's going to run with a different value because I changed the parameters to the aggregate itself. So it's very clear when the aggregate parameters change, I'm gonna have to do like, the work that is going to be done is much larger. Users can understand that much more easily than if they were all jumbled together. And if you change some of them, it would work fine and others it wouldn't and like, it just gets weird. Okay, cool. Um, so now, we get into uh, some of the, uh, the really fun stuff, I think. Um, enabling easy to understand rollups and with logically consistent results. Um, and I know this is one that Ryan loves. Uh, so uh, yeah, so let's, let's think for a minute um, about some reaggregation issues. So one thing that we know is that uh, with something like sum, I can reaggregate it very simply. Like the sum of the value from the table um, is going to be the same as if I grouped by something else and then re-aggregated the sum. That's not true for average, right? The average of the average is not going to be the same as the overall average. Um, and it's a little bit unclear which aggregates that's true for and which is not. Uh, I have to know things about the internal way that the aggregate works in order to figure out that this is true. For instance, with count, it's not true. The count of the count is not actually the, the overall count. I have to do something different. I can sum the count in order to get an overall count. But again, that's like something that I have to know as a user and think about every time I run the aggregate. 
instead of just having a single way of doing it for all of our aggregates. So, um, and this comes up a lot in something like continuous aggregates, where we create a, uh, our continuous aggregate, say at 15 minutes, and then a user comes and says, hey, I want to uh, re-aggregate this to an hour. Well, which aggregates can you do that for? How do you do that? Um, we have the sum, the average, and the percentile lag. So for all of the things in toolkit, um, we want to be able to answer the question, which ones can I re-aggregate and which can't I, very easily. Um, so in our case, we have this roll-up function. And if there's a roll-up function defined, then you can re-aggregate. There may be some caveats with pdigest, for instance, there's some slight caveats that you could get slightly more error or slightly different results. But for most of them, you're going to get the exact result um, if you do a roll up or if you do it the other way. So what roll up does is, again, we have that, that continuous aggregate that we defined. Uh, here, I simplified it quickly just to have the percentile lag. Um, and now we can just run if I want a one day aggregate out of my 15 minute aggregates, you know, maybe I'm sampling every second, right? So once I get to 15 minutes, my one day aggregate is gonna be much more efficient, right? I'm only gonna have a couple hundred results. Um, and so then I just run a proxy percentile on roll up of percentile ad and boom, I get my median over the whole day. I can also do that across IDs in this case. So I could even rewrite this query and instead of, I, could, I might want a 15 minute uh, percentile over all my IDs in order to compare the 15 minute performance of one thing to the overall. There are lots of different ways we can use that. It's really cool to be able to do that. We also, a little sneak preview here, we have a stats ag, this is an experimental, so this won't quite work. You have to add in toolkit experimental to all this stuff. Um, but we have a stats ag uh, aggregate uh, that's doing statistical aggregates. Um, and that allows you to do something like rolling. Um, rolling actually does some interesting optimizations under the hood that allows you to do some work with the transition function and, and makes things nice uh, for windowed aggregates in particular. But this is a good way of computing a uh, moving average. Um, and so th this is that's something that's actually pretty hard to do in Postgres. You need to like get a sum and a count and then uh, divide them. Uh, and you need to do those over the right windows. And like, it just gets really complex for no real, no great reason anyway. Um, so we wanted to make something that made that easier. So here's our rolling stats aggregate. This allows you to do, in this case, it's actually, it could be tumbling window. So you do a five minute bucket first, and then uh, you do it that way. Otherwise you can actually even do it as a, uh, you could just do a stats ag, you don't need the rolling. Um, you don't need to do the, the whole thing. You could just do it straight over a 30 minute window. So um, logically consistent rollups. Uh, and then our final thing on why um, is easier retrospective analysis of bound sample data. So continuous aggregates, we populate them. And then one of the things that we might do with a continuous aggregate like this is drop the underlying data. So I have secondly, secondly data or something like that, let's say. Um, I only want 15 minutes for like once I'm older than a month or two, I'm not going to need the secondly data. So I just keep my 15 minute data. So that gets dropped. Um, and so in my first analysis of this, I just want to find the median. So I define my continuous aggregate and I just want the median. Okay, that's fine. Um, but then my requirements change, but my data is already gone. So I can't go back and recalculate that. So at least, uh, at least sometimes it's easier to just be able to, um, looks like I deleted the slide by accident, but I can just come in here and update it, right? And say, I want the approx percentile. Let's say I want the 90th percentile. Okay, I just changed my query. Right, so now look at that, I'm done. Um, I haven't had to do anything else in order to update my requirements. I don't have to go back and like reload my data and recalculate my continuous aggregate um, or modify the continuous aggregate in any way, which right now requires dropping and recomputing the continuous aggregate. I just have uh, the data there. I can go in and, and get more data out. 
And in fact, uh, things like uh, our percentile approximations even have uh, things like mean uh, when we can do things like that or sum. Uh, I think that that actually is in there or count that are exposed so that you can add in more analyses you didn't even know you wanted and also keep your continuous aggregate smaller because you don't need to separately calculate those. Um, so there are different accessory functions that may not actually be related to percentile approximation, but because we have that data structure there that already allows you to do that, we figure why not expose it? Allow the user to do different things with that one data structure so that if they create a continuous aggregate and then later realize, hey, I want the average as well to compare to my mean or something like that, I can do that. Um, and I don't actually need to store any more data. I don't need to do anything else. Um, so we're allowing more types of retrospective analysis by doing that. So the goal here is just change the query, don't change the aggregate. So that's retro retrospective analysis. And now we'll move on to our final, uh, final um, section. Um, so how does this like impact something like time-weighted average code? Um, and if you saw my last talk, we talked a bit about time-weighted averages um, and we had a sort of uh, representation if my screen would update uh, like this uh, to derive a time-weighted average. Um, so we have some points, they're not evenly spaced. Uh, we have some time over which they're, uh, they're going. Um, so let's look at how we actually end up representing this uh, inside. Um, and so what the representation ends up looking like is we actually keep the first and last points, and then we treat the area under the curve essentially as our weighted sum. So we call that W sum. Um, in pseudocode, uh, let's remember sort of what we're what we're doing with time weighted averages. Um, we have the area under the curve divided by delta t is going to be our time weighted average. Um, again, we have the average accessor, the time weight aggregate, um, and our internal representation in pseudocode is going to be something like time weight summary. Right, is our weighted sum and then our first and last points, basically. Um, so again, that's what that looks like in the graphical representation, our first and our last points, uh, and then our weighted sum. In order to calculate the average, right? So what is that going to do? Well, it's gonna compute the delta T from the last point and the first point, the time values for both of those. And then it's gonna give me uh, the W sum divided by that delta T and return a time weighted average. So why did we do that rather than just storing the delta t? Well, let's think about the roll up function because that was another thing that we had designed for. We wanted to be able to roll these up. So let's think about what would happen if we had multiple of these uh, sections in time and we wanted to add them together in order to produce a single time weighted average over the entire time. Well, if you think about what would happen for the entire time, you don't wanna just add the W sums of both of them. You wanna make sure that you take into account this gap that's in between them. We can't just like leave that area out. That actually has meaning. We need to deal with it. So that's why we use the first and the last points here. So what's gonna happen is, again, remember our time weight summary is the weighted sum and the first and last point. So in order to compute the, the, the weighted sum and the gap, we actually are just applying the, the usual time weight function that we have applied in order to produce basically this entire result, it's or something like it, right? So we're gonna do that with the last point from the first weighted sum. So that's last one in this diagram. Uh, and the first point in the second weighted sum. So that's first two in that diagram. So we're gonna do the time weight. In order to get our the weighted sum in the gap, we're gonna do the time weight of the summary, summary one last point and summary two first point. And we're going to get the W sum from that. So now our total is going to be the gap plus the weighted sum of each of the summaries. And then we just basically construct a new time weight summary from all of that uh, in order to get our overall time weight summary. And we'll get something whoops, that looks like this, which includes the gap in the weighted sum that it is going to return. So in order to compute the average, again, I can just subtract T2 from T1 and uh, uh, take the weighted sum and divide by that. So that's sort of how it affects our code. Um, 
when we are thinking about things like rollups, et cetera, we have to design our data structures internally in order to uh, actually really work with this sort of design um, and allow for all of the things that this, this API allows. So that's uh, the, uh, that's actually the end of what I have for today. Um, and I think now we have time for lots of questions if folks have them. Um, uh, Tyler, it seems like you had a question from before. Um, are there storage implications of the increased flexibility in the retrospective, retrospective analysis and power data structure? Um, there are storage implications, um, at least some. Um, it does mean that at least some of these data structures are going to be larger than they otherwise might be. Um, that's mostly to allow for rollups, uh, which at least in our current continuous aggregate implementation, you need to allow for anyway. Um, so there isn't going to be a huge storage implication in our, in our current continuous aggregate implementation where we store partial states anyway. So this would be what we would have to store as the partial state no matter what. Um, so we are just sort of uh, allowing that to happen and making it more explicit so that the rollups are exposed. Right now, uh, continuous aggregates always store that partial state. So they would be storing all of that data no matter what. Um, and, and so it, there's actually not a huge storage impl Im implication there. Um, what it does allow you to do is limit the number of aggregates that you need to do. Um, so you can then use a single aggregate to get multiple results, which means you're not going to be storing the partial states that might have applied to you know, one or two or three different things. Um, we are going to allow you to reuse those. So it can actually reduce storage in some cases, if that helps. Other questions? What are some of the upcoming functions that you know benefit from this this rollup and and you know as you've said a couple of times when when I finally got this about two months ago from your last <laughs> talk and understood the potential to continuous aggregates it, it's what so many users ask for you know I have a five minute continuous aggregate or you know whatever one hour and I'd like to get daily can I do that can I make another continuous aggregate on a continuous aggregate and the answer yeah, is always been no this is because of the partials it's really difficult. Yeah, and I think that that's, um, you know, I think that there are various things that we're, we're thinking about doing in terms of improving continuous aggregates that are also going to help with this, this performance. Um, uh, but the, um, and Solar, I'll get to your question in a second. Um, yeah, I think that that's a really, a really big thing is being able to very consistently just know when you can do that and perform that straight on the aggregate. Um, we did have some workarounds where you could like modify the view to like, actually go down and aggregate the partials in the way that we do it. And it's like really hacky and kind of painful for users. Um, so we wanted to make that really simple um, uh, and, and take advantage of some of that uh, very nicely here. Um, so I think that this is a, is a pretty cool, cool thing for doing that. Um, one thing that you might want to think about, by the way, Tyler, actually going back to your last question, is for something like percentile ag, um, it's giving you a very nice and detailed view of your data. And depending on the size of the um, UDD sketch, it can be pretty large as a partial state, right? You might have 200 buckets there. So it could be relatively large. I mean, we do any sorts of you know, size reduction we can internally to our data structures, um, but it can still be larger than usual. Um, but because it's also giving you a much more granular view of the data than say average or something like that, um, and a much more sort of, uh, I'd say anyway, you can get more granular on that. So you might want to go to a larger aggregation level to start. So you might want to go up to an hour or a day uh, with your continuous aggregate um, just to limit the size that you're storing. Because if you're storing 200 points and you only have 200 points in a 15 minute period, like you're not actually getting much. Um, so you want to make sure that your aggregate length in terms of time is sized correctly for your uh, for the data structure that you're using. Um, are there cases where two data re regions overlap? So this is actually an interesting thing with uh, time-weighted averages. Um, we have defined this so that it will error if you do that uh, because it actually does not make sense to do that. So this is, um, uh, we have to have non-overlapping regions 
in order for this to work, it will error if you give it overlapping regions. It also doesn't make any sense to have overlapping regions in a continuous aggregate for this. Um, you only, for, for time weighted averages, you, you can't actually work between multiple, say, IDs or time series. You need to have a single time series that you're working with, or the analysis just doesn't make sense at all. You can't have like results from two different sensors and you're trying to average them together in a weird way that you need to have basically one time series in order for it to work. Um, so uh, in this case, we define it such that it can't have overlap. For other things, uh, there can be overlap uh, and it will work that way. Um, and this is actually a distinction inside the aggregates as well. Um, there are some of our aggregates that are partializable but not parallelizable because Postgres, when it parallelizes, it actually sends sort of random rows to each instance. Um, so you won't get these nice non-overlapping regions, um, but it is actually partializable, which means it can be used in continuous aggregates where you're guaranteed to have a contiguous region. Um, it can also work in uh, partition-wise aggregation and multi-node, um, which is because again, you're guaranteed based on the way that we define our constraints on the chunks in a hypertable to have non-overlapping regions uh, there. So uh, we've thought about that pretty heavily and made sure that those aggregates that, that need that sort of guarantee are defined correctly internally so that they will work in the cases where they can and not work in the cases where they, they, they won't. Other questions? Uh, just again, to keep clarifying or hacking around in this two-step thing, I just want to make sure, you know, should someone watch this in a couple of months, you know, there is no specific guarantee that says, hey, we have 15 minute roll up and you can aggregate that to a year and expect, you know, at some level, you're going to have to be thoughtful about how high you're aggregating from performance perspective or not. Maybe that's the question. Oh, uh, from performance pr perspective or from a... Um, uh, mostly performance, you know, sometimes it's easy for someone to say, oh, I can do this. Why isn't it returning in, in half a second? Like, well, yeah, so you're I still mean, aggregating I, your data. Like it's just reality. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, um, that's, that's totally true. And you may want to define like, you know, if, if you're going to a year and you have a 15 minute continuous aggregate, you might also want to define a daily continuous aggregate, right? Um, so that you can get to a year with, you know, a, an order of magnitude or two less work. Um, it, sometimes the combined functions in essence are a little bit more expensive than the raw aggregate. Um, so sometimes that roll up is a little bit more expensive because you have a bit more work to do um, than, than otherwise. It depends on the function, uh, of course. Um, but uh, so, so yes, that can sometimes be more expensive. But if you're working in the case where, um, where we have uh, a lot of data going into a single period, um, then almost always it's still going to be more efficient to do that. Um, I will also say, I know MOTS is, we're working on some things around continuous aggregates so that one of the places where you can get caught um, is that they try to do aggregation across chunks before then doing this next level of aggregation. So we're trying to eliminate that across chunk aggregation uh, because that introduces some very odd performance things. Uh, I think mostly around creating a lot of aggregate nodes um, or aggregate, not nodes, but uh, aggregate essentially groups. Um, so each instance of the aggregate sort of group uh, has to be called, even though most of them aren't actually doing any work uh, just because we might have things that span chunks. So we're gonna try and eliminate that and try to do that ahead of time. So we don't have to do that aggregation step um, and there are some things around continuous aggregates that'll just be more intuitive. Um, like if users run select star limit 10, it'll just return instead of uh, having to do a whole set of aggregation and then return, um, which is I know very confusing for some users because they're like, wait, this was supposed to be faster, but it's taking 10 times as long as this returning to the table because I added this limit clause and like now it's just aggregating the whole thing before it can return uh, even those first 10 rows. So those are some of the things that we're gonna work on there. Um, and, and try to make sure it works better. A quick question. What are the types of these functions that return partials? Uh, are you using a byte array or something else? Um, so we have, uh, uh, in the PGX, uh, 
So we use uh, Rust's, uh, the Rust PGX uh, library for all of this, and we define uh, custom types. Um, there's a little bit of like, uh, but this time weight summary actually will look something like this, for instance, internally. Um, they have an internal representation uh, that is, and, and so they have in app functions um, and various other functions that we define, serialize, whatever else uh, for each of the types. Um, there are actually separate types for that, that we use internally to the aggregates themselves that are slightly different than the ones that we output um, for various reasons. Um, and all of our all of our types actually have a version as well. Um, and we're doing that for backwards compatibility. So if we eventually come up with a more efficient representation for the UD sketch or something like that, um, we will maintain backwards compatibility with the old version of UDD sketch while the new stuff will output the new version. Uh, we may eventually also have some way of converting the old representation into the new one if there's, if there's a way to do that. So there are various things that we do in order to make those representations backwards compatible and, and work and, and, and sort of play nicely with others. Um, uh, so that's, that's the basic gist. We haven't completely, we haven't had to deal with that yet. Um, that's part of the reason that we have the experimental schema is to make sure that, that we try to get these things right before we fully, before we stabilize them, because uh, that's like a pretty painful operation to go back and change a data structure. Um, we would prefer not to do that. Um, so we don't have too many different, um, we haven't completely gone through that process yet. Uh, but yeah, so internally they are, uh, they're defined as real types. Uh, in essence, in Postgres, they have some string output they don't have all of the casts. They don't have everything defined for them, but they're they're pretty good. Um, all of the functions that we need to work on them work on them. They're not just defined as byte arrays. Um, okay. Well, one of the reasons to why I'm asking is we have requests for actually being able to compress continuous aggregates, and yeah. we have good compression for certain types like the delta yep. delta encoding or the gorilla encoding, but we yep. don't have particularly good compression for byte arrays or opaque types. Yeah. So the question is, is it possible to, in those situations where the uh, partial aggregate actually is makes sense to use as a, a real type that could potentially compress well? Yeah. Is that possible so, or is that something that we should consider? Um, I think it's definitely something that we should, we should think a little bit about. I think that there's uh, a few things. So we, we've talked a little bit about how we might be able to do that. I think that there's a few um, a, a few things that would help is uh, one would be um, providing sort of a compression option that does work better on opaque types, um, like an LZ4 or something like that, uh, that that works better than the, the PGLZ one that, you know, is only okay. Um, it's still going to be better than nothing uh, in, in any case. Um, and then the other thing that we were thinking about is uh, when you all are uh, defining how this works for various aggregates, A, we do have an, so, so the way that you store it now as, as a partial will still be a byte array. Um, and we will actually, I mean, we'll have some more knowledge and we know how that works. So we make sure to do the right thing when we serialize um, and come up with a good small representation. Um, so, you know, that's, that's, uh, we don't have any of our sort of expanded forms, for instance, in the actual internal aggregate for time weight summary, we actually build up an, a, a buffer of points, then we order them, and then we run this calculation, and we end up with this, but you have to buffer that array of points first. So we do that munging before we output in the serialized form for the continuous aggregate case, for instance. Um, but that's a sort of uh, different uh, different thing, um, and we can, uh, yeah. Remind, but the, remind me, please. Uh, mm -hmm. The partial, the, the transition function, does it have to return an internal type, or can it return any any kind of type? No, it can return any type. Any type, but there's some. Um, uh, we are returning internal for all of ours for various reasons. Um, there are certain things that we wanted to be able to do with internal types there. Um, so we return internal for all of our uh, all of our aggregate 
uh, functions. And I don't remember exactly the reasoning behind all of that. Josh would know better than I would. Um, but, but we could potentially return a type that compress well, for example. And we could yeah, also, and the other if we, we could have a more, more um, uh, make it more possible to actually expand. So we could potentially return a record from this type. And actually, yeah, the, the other thing that we can materialization do... actually split this into separate columns, for example, that would compress very well and still be. That in could line be one way that we designed. could do it. The other option, and I think that, you know, one thing that I wanted to talk with you all about was actually to provide an interface, uh, in essence, to define a compression for a given aggregate um, so that you could say, hey, I want to, we could register with time scale. Hey, this is the compression algorithm I want to use for this. And then we could provide the compression algorithm. So we could write that in Rust as well, just to find that function. And then all you would have to do is call the right function on it, and it would do the right thing in terms of compressing it. Um, so no matter what type it is, it, we might have to modify it to, to output a real type, depending on what we wanted to do. But um, even if it's not outputting a real type, even if it, if it is outputting internal, um, we could define it basically based on the aggregate to do some sort of extra compression on that. Um, and then we can write that in Rust and just deal with our internal types nicely. So there's a few possible ways that we could, we could think about defining that. We'll have to, I, I think that that's a great thing for our two teams to sort of get together and discuss um, at some point as we think about, uh, as we're sort of optimizing all of this. Um, so that, that would be, I think that's a, that's a great idea to do. Um, I don't know that we need to do it all uh, uh, now though. So maybe we can okay. absolutely schedule that though. Well, we'll stop there. Uh, this is lovely. Thank you all for coming. Um, really appreciate all the good questions um, and hope you guys enjoyed the talk. See you later.